Well, either welcome back from your spring break or uh, congratulations on it, interrupting your spring break while you uh, to do a little bit of studying for the exam. What I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight the particularly important areas off of each of the slides. This should motivate you to go back and look into the textbooks to make sure you understand these comments. I'm going to try to cover this material quickly and talk fast so that you um, don't take up too much of your time to look at these videos. And again, my goal is to point you into concepts that you need to make sure that you understand. And so the idea of corporate strategy is simply <clears throat> uh, what businesses should we be in. The idea of diversification is that you can be in many different product lines as opposed to a single business. And so part of corporate strategy is figuring out which businesses we should be in and how we try to generate synergy. The, the ultimate well, let me go on to the next slide. These were just some examples I used to illustrate these things. Um, you can see off of this chart, if you remember, I told you do not worry about related constrained or linked. The constrained or linked, you don't need to worry about. The three levels I want you to understand of diversification are if it's a dominant business, which we'll define as 70% or more of a single uh, revenue business, whether they have some or idea of related diversification, which we'll talk about more later, or if they're unrelated diversification, which is to say that there are no common links. And again, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more on a slide. So to go back, the most one of the most important concepts, concepts that you understand is why should companies prefer diversification strategies? And it's very important is this idea of better off test. In other words, when you put these two things together, they ought to be worth more than they would be separately. If they're not, it's the diversification isn't working and that really is the ultimate test are they better off defined as more profitable together than they would be if they were operated in uh, separate companies and then we talked about how synergy is the search for pirates treasure uh, often searched for not always very often found and the simple way simplest way to think of synergy is one plus one equals three which is another way to talk about this better off test that because these companies are together their profitability is higher than they would be separately because something is going on inside that company uh, from a macro perspective these two are for related diversification and that is the idea of we develop economies of scope, which we'll talk about on the next slide, or we gain market power, and we'll talk about that more a little bit later. Unrelated diversification is largely a financial play. Sometimes there are corporate parenting advantages, but a lot of it is about um, being able to do financial, uh, understanding the finances of one business and making good decisions, and then being able to restructure. So again, we talked about... Um, economies of scope and the magic word of economies of scope is sharing you'll have several questions on the exam they're going to challenge you to identify whether there is sharing taking place whether that sharing is the corporate relatedness which is to say they're sharing their know-how or whether the sharing is operational relatedness which is they have some operations or physical components in common that they're able to use in both of the businesses and so uh, a good part of the exam is can you identify sharing? Can you then attribute that to a related diversification strategy? And whether that sharing is likely to add value. Again, do not worry about the words constrained and linked. I'm simply going to ask you to know unrelated diversification, related diversification, or then if a uh, single business or dominant business. We talked about how Procter & Gamble was a poster child of relatedness, and we went into great extent as to how they did quite a bit of sharing. Then we looked at GE and showed how they didn't do nearly as much sharing, and this was starting to become more unrelated. We talked about market power and how this often comes through vertical integration. By all means, go and read the textbook about vertical integration because we talked in class verbally about some pros and cons of vertical integration, uh, you're probably going to want to go back to the textbook to dive more into that as well. And then we get to unrelated diversification. I threw in there the idea that this is about having leadership as a core competency, and Danaher was our case study for that, of how they just know how to run manufacturing plants. 
Then you get into the idea of restructuring, sometimes unrelated uh, diversification is about restructuring, and these are identifying likely candidates for restructuring and what are those sorts of things. Antiquated businesses that are not up to date, uh, businesses that are in the middle of a downturn, who've been allowed to deteriorate. Uh, these are all good restructuring targets. But a lot of the unrelated diversification philosophy is this efficient internal markets and resource allocation. And again, I encourage you to take a good look at that section of the textbook to make sure that you understand that. Um, I'll be honest with you, even though these are important, I did not choose to put any questions uh, on the exam about the value neutral and the bad reasons to diversify. I'm kind of sticking with the positive. And then to wrap it up, uh, what we're seeing is a trend towards uh, companies going back to their business models, their, their basic business models. Uh, and so going with either uh, dominant businesses or highly related diversification. Uh, that said, even though unrelated diversification is somewhat out, there are still plenty of firms that are practicing it. So this is uh, the recap of chapter six, and I didn't mention it earlier, but there will be 10 questions from each chapter uh, on the exam. Hang on just a minute, I'm gonna switch slides and we'll start chapter seven. And now we're on to chapter seven, and this is mergers and acquisitions, or what I call corporate strategy at work. A couple of the basic terminology uh, that you're gonna to wanna to make sure you understand. A merger is where companies, um, come together on a relatively co-equal basis. And I gave you the example of Daimler and Chrysler. Um, and this is a great example of how really there are very few mergers. Um, a merger implies co-equal status, and that's just not the way it typically happens. Typically, one firm dominates the other, even if it's as advertised in the case of Daimler and Chrysler, co-equal in reality, because Daimler was uh, bigger and outperforming Chrysler, Daimler dominated that uh, situation, even though it was billed as a merger. So true mergers are pretty infrequent deals. Then you have the more common terminology of a of a acquisition, which is where there's clearly uh, an acquirer or the big dog and a target, the little dog. And the big dog is going to go get the little dog. Uh, you're also going to hear the term takeover or hostile takeover, and that is an unwelcome approach. Then down at the bottom, how well does it work? And the reality is when you track the results of M&As, typically when the uh, acquisition is announced, the acquirer's stock price, the person making the offer, usually goes down. Not up, but down because the market says, oh, the target's stock price goes up. And usually for a target firm, an M&A always works out well in that their shareholders make money. Historically, um, the results for the acquisition firm, for the acquiring firm, is very neutral, very close to zero on average, uh, although often it dips when it's first announced. Uh, so this isn't a panacea. I talked about some examples. I gave you a simple way to organize these in your mind, and we're going to talk about them, but, but there's M&As as consolidations. This is where two companies or two or more companies get together to bulk up, M&A's is extension. This is where two or more companies get together, and it's usually because the acquirer wants to enter a new market, be it geographic or product, and it wants to do it fast. Then we have M&A's is entrepreneurship. You see these a lot, but you don't tend to read about them because it's usually a very big company or a medium-sized company buying a very small company. And this is all about trying to learn and be more innovative for the future. So let's go back to M&A's is consolidation. It's going to be very important for the exam that you know a horizontal versus a vertical. A vertical is you're buying someone who was previously a supplier or a buyer, whereas a horizontal is someone that's basically a competitor to you, or they're in the same market as you are. Even if they were geographically separated, they're doing the same thing that you're doing. The logic of a consolidation is build market power, which is to say, through getting bigger, we're able to get better deals, we're able to get better deals from, buyer, from our suppliers, we're able to charge our buyers more. And then often we achieve cost savings because we downsize. We had uh, two HR departments, two legal departments, two marketing departments, and because our businesses are very similar, we're able to consolidate them and save money in the process. The next is mergers and acquisitions as extensions. And this again is where we enter new geographic 
in product markets. Geography is important because usually cross border, it's easier to enter if there's a, it's easier to enter a country if you're doing it with a, uh, a host national presence, which sometimes is done through an acquisition. New products is, developing new products is actually time consuming and expensive. So by buying a company that, that has a product line, this allows a company to diversify quickly and typically at lower cost and with lower risk. Sometimes cost savings are possible in extension M&As, but that's not the dominant economic logic. Uh, M&As as entrepreneurships are great and they're important, but they're not on the exam, so I'm going to skip over that. Basic steps in the, in the process, we talked about uh, screening and approaching the target, due diligence, which is where you check out uh, what the company really is. And so remember my dating analogy, this is where you identify the girl you think you want to date because boy, she looks smart and she's attractive. Due diligence is where you do date her to get to know her better and then negotiate. This really doesn't fit in the dating marrying analogy. This is where you figure out the terms of the deal. Then the deal happens and you integrate, which is where the two shall become one. Then we talk about what doesn't go well. And the I like what this slide says. The textbook explains it. I don't want to say differently, but they accentuate different points. So when you read the textbook to prepare for the exam, make sure you understand their points. Some of them are, it's just a poor fit. Due diligence, you didn't do a good job with uh, in your due diligence phase. You didn't see that things weren't right. You missed cost flags. You missed problems in the company. In the negotiation phase, a common problem is overpaying. Uh, and I said, in general, acquisition premiums typically above about 25% would be considered too much. Having multiple bidders get into the process often drives the price up. And then often overpaying leads to too much debt. Then you have to integrate and run the businesses. And a big problem here is that if the, if the management team is focused on uh, doing deals because doing deals is sexy, um, then they're paying attention to the M&A process, the dating process, and not the being married process. And uh, managers overly focused on acquisitions is another problem. Uh, the keys to success vary. You're going to see a table out of the textbook. These are good things to, for you to know. I don't think there's an exam question directly, but understanding them will probably um, help you get some other questions as well. Again, these are all good things to, to consider. Again, not a direct question out of here, but uh, worth understanding. And then we have uh, the opposite of M&As, which is restructuring, although some of these sometimes go in conjunction with uh, M&As, and specific, specifically that's downsizing. Downsizing often goes with a consolidation M&A where you let people go. Downscoping is the opposite of an M&A in that you're actually selling off parts of the business. You're not just letting people go, you're letting whole product lines go, whole divisions go. And leverage buyout opportunities are about going private. We talked about Dell was an example of an LBO. Right now, Halliburton and the energy downturn is letting people go. That's downsizing and downscoping. Target right now, they're actually shedding their stores in Canada and completely closing the international uh, division. Remember this comment here, don't worry about the stuff about uh, private equity on pages 214 and 15. Here are uh, a more complete explanation of what happens with downsizing, scoping, and a leverage buyout. And then again, uh, a couple of the big picture stuff, you're going to be asking the test questions to look at various uh, M&As and understand, is it horizontal? Is it vertical? What's the, the economic rationale for it? We've talked about they don't often work well. It's typically bad for the acquiring firm stock price in the beginning and over time. It's not clear that the acquiring firm gets any benefit, although clearly the target firm does uh, get some benefit. And then these are the general principles to good M&As, sound logic, friendly, with a hostile takeover being the exact opposite of friendly. And the problem with the hostile takeovers is uh, a, it can trigger bidding wars, because when you put a company in play, other people may go, well, we want that too. And then secondly, uh, because it's not a friendly affair, they don't tend to cooperate in due diligence. 
Also, hostile takeovers often end up overpaying because the company resists it, and then you want to quickly and skillfully put the thing together. So, 10 questions out of Chapter 7. I'm going to stop and make this one video in, in and of itself, and we'll have a separate video for the remaining two chapters.